Happy birthday, Rolling Stone. This year is Rolling Stone's 20th birthday, and every issue is a celebration. When I was a teen, I had this issue of Rolling Stone I used to read a lot. Issue number 1094. And inside, it contains the magazine's list of the greatest songs and albums of the 2000s. I read this magazine front and back multiple times, learning about acts from the previous decade that I was not aware of. As a teenager, I lived in an area where outside of the pop charts, country, and classic rock stations, there isn't much else to work with. H to the Izzo, v to the Izzo. So with this issue, I was given a decade worth of music to catch up on. I discovered artists that I grew to love, such as LCD Sound System and MGMT. Found out there was more to Outkast than just hey y'all. And overall, getting a sense of what kind of music is out there. And there were plenty of songs on the list that became some of my all-time favorites. But one song in particular caught my eye. Number 7 on their list. Maps by Yeah Yeah Yeahs. <laughs> Being the sheltered child that I was with music, I barely knew anyone Rolling Stone was writing about, so when I saw an act named Yeah Yeah Yeahs, that piqued my interest. So I decided to listen to it, just like all the other songs on the best of list. And once I did, it took me years to re-listen to the song again, and more importantly, to watch the music video to it. This led me to watching one of the most sobering music videos I've ever seen. On the surface, Maps' music video looks like any other rock music video, having the members performing the song, though with the audience watching. But things do get interesting as the video goes on, and that mostly has to do with the band's lead singer, Karen O. Oh, say, 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 oh, say, say, say. What she did during this music video sealed the deal for the band's success, as it helped the three-person group hit it big on both MTV and on the internet. Keep in mind, this song came out in 2003, so for it to be a big hit on the internet, that's impressive. As well as giving the album its offer, Beaver to Tell, a massive boost in sales. So for this history lesson, we are going to be discussing the unexpected commercial success and major influence this indie band garnered thanks to a song that might have never gotten released as a single. And the only reason it did was because of its music video. So there's no more time to wait, as it is once again music video time, and we are talking about Yeah Yeah's Maps. This is going to become a fever to tell, I can assure you. There you go then, the best new tunes in our tires. And now on 4Play, it's one of the most talked about bands of the moment. Are the Yeah Yeah Yeah's worth the hype? You be the judge. <laughs> Before making their first album, the Yeah were already making a name for themselves in New York. During this era, we had the post-punk revival being the genre that was claimed to have saved rock and roll. I mean, that's what this Rolling Stone headline said. Also, I know nothing about the Vines and continue to live my life that way. Yeah, yeah consists of just three members. Karen Lee Orzalik as the vocalist, also known as Karen O, Brian Chase on drums, and Nick Zinner as the guitarist. They made a name for themselves for their live performances. <laughs> and being on the scene with other acts like The White Stripes, The Strokes, and TV on the radio. Eventually, they did make two EPs, with their self-titled debut from 2001 and 2002's Machine. From their brand new album, Fever to Tell, please welcome Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. After the release of Machine, the band members began work on their first studio album, Fever the Tell, and they put utmost focus on getting this record completed, going the route of self-financing the album. Karen O herself said in a spin article, We were all living together and all the money we used to fund it came out of our pockets. Once Fever the Tell was completed, they were originally going to have it released under the label Touch and Go, the same label they did with Machine, but they instead went with Interscope as they wanted to go mainstream. A lot of post-punk revival acts were getting picked up by major record labels at this time. Karen O herself mentioned that Lee Ronaldo of Sonic Youth advised him to go this route. And you can't say no to anyone from Sonic Youth. So with that, Fever the Tell was released on April 29, 2003, which included Maps, the ninth track off their album. And on release, it received positive reception from numerous outlets. Well, more than that, as it would later rank on numerous best of lists 
that year by various sites and magazines. However, despite the positive critical reception, the sales were a bit different. Initially, the album did well on the charts, entering the Billboard 200 charts at 67 during the week of May 17, 2003. That's not bad for an indie band's debut, though by next week it was bumped down to 132. At the beginning of June, it was at 175, and then dropped off the top 200 after. While it does sound like as if like this album didn't do too well, it is important to note that in the UK, the year has had a massive following, to the point of being offered $15,000 and a high slot to appear at England's Reading Festival in 2002, but they declined the offer to finish the album. <laughs> Over in the UK is a much different story. Fever the Tell debuted at number 13 for the week of May 10th, 2003, which was the peak for that album, but it stayed on the charts for 10 weeks. Overall, with a decent launch in the US and a much better sales in the UK, by the end of 2003, the album sold 100,000 copies. Singles-wise, their first two singles were also hits. Date for the Night peaked at number 16, and Pin peaked at 29. However, these peaked in the UK. Their peaks in the US are non-existent because as far as I understand, these two songs weren't singles in the US. Why was that? I'm not fully sure. For some reason, the first single off the album in the US would be Maps, but that would be later. And even then, the band was originally reluctant to even have it be a single. Knowing its importance and influence in rock since its release, you have to wonder why the band was against making Maps a single. From the 2017 oral history, Meet Me in the Bathroom, Birth and Rock and Roll in New York City 2001 to 2011 by Lizzie Goodman, TV on the Radio's Julio Button had the answer. Fear the Tell was produced by TV on the Radio's Dave Sidek, who got the job because he was good friends with Karen and guitarist Nick Zenner, having known them from when he was their boss at a triple five soul clothing store. As Julio said, that was the first song of theirs that I was like, what are you doing? This is the single for the record. Dave said, no, they don't want to put it out. I'm like, this is insane. I'm the dummy who likes the B-sides, whatever, but this song is the song, it's the f***ing song, there's no doubt about it. There doesn't seem to be a clear reason why they were so hesitant on releasing Maps as a single. Kieran O herself said that she wanted to be signed on a major record label because she wanted people to listen to Maps. Though it may have to do with Maps being nothing like the rest of the album, not being the same energy as the other tracks. But is that a bad thing? There have been moments where these types of songs boosted sales for an album. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Good Riddance, Time of Your Life is a major outlier for Green Day's Nimrod and their discography, and that was a huge hit for the band. On the flip side of things, Zombies by the Cranberries was a massive hit for a normally softer sounding rock band. Yeah. Personally speaking, I bought a used copy of the Cranberries, No Need to Argue, expecting tracks to be like Zombie. Do, 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 do. I was absolutely mistaken, but Zombie is still phenomenal. Eventually, on September 22nd, 2003, Maps was released as a single in the UK. Why does this keep happening to me? And just like the previous two singles, it charted, debuting at 26 on the UK charts for the week of October 4th, 2003. But once again, for whatever reason, the song wasn't released as a single in the US. In fact, Maps didn't even get released until 2004. But despite of a US release, Maps still ended up having a music video in 2003. I couldn't find the exact date Maps' music video was released in this little wild, but it does appear to have happened before or around the beginning of September 2003, as seen by this news update the band did on their website. In fact, the video was voted number one on the NME's chart show on MTV2 Europe, so there was a lot of love for this video all the way in Europe, and a reaction to the music video would eventually get Maps to be released as a US single. But you might be wondering, how is the music video the reason Maps is a single in the US? And that's a good question. Since it wasn't released as a single, it couldn't be played on MTV. And YouTube wasn't created yet, so it couldn't have been seen on there. Best live music and more. And now, here's Jerry. But just because it wasn't on MTV doesn't mean it wasn't being played on US television stations. Just that it was being played on smaller stations, like Chicago-based TV show, JBTV. But a public access show in Chicago isn't going to get the ball rolling. So, what is the catalyst for Maps in the music video to garner popularity in its home country? Napster. 
As bizarre as it may seem for some, since Napster is heavily associated with its original iteration as a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing website that eventually shut down due to its numerous copyright infringement lawsuits, one could forget that it did come back from the dead. Okay, it came back from the dead twice, but I'm talking about the first time. The website's assets were sold to the American software company, Roxio, and it became a legitimate music streaming and digital store in 2003. And through this version of Napster, Maps was a sensation online, with his download rates on there beating out others. And it's because of this success, the song itself started getting requested to play on the radio. And with the demand of Maps being at an all-time high, on February 10th, 2004, the song was finally released as a single in the United States, which could not have been better timing as on February 8th, 2004, the Grammy Awards that year was broadcasted on CBS, and the Yarriers were nominated for a Grammy that night. Fever to Tell was nominated for Best Alternate Music Album, however, the award was presented off camera, and they later ended up losing to the White Stripes with their album, Elephant. <laughs> Hey, it's the album with Seven Nation Army off it. Everyone else in that category was destined to lose. But February 2004 would be an important time for Yeah Yeahs as the single's release also meant the music video would be finally shown on MTV. First being recorded on Billboard's video monitor for MTV on the week of February 1st, then on MTV 2's list the following week. And once the video started playing on the channel, people were finally able to watch one of the most heartbreaking music videos out there. So now I think it's an appropriate time to finally talk about the music video itself and see what makes this music video so beloved. The music video was directed by Patrick Daughters, a friend of Karen's whom she met at New York University. I am growing tired of her game. Daughters had made short films before this, including the short film Unloved, which was for a contest held by Nintendo for the game Eternal Darkness. Daughters won and he got the $20,000 grand prize. He also directed the music video for Yeah Yeah's Date with the Night. Most of the footage is just the band performing with other shots of them goofing off. <laughs> Pretty energetic video overall, but Maps would be more like a typical concept video in comparison. When the music video starts, it opens in a big area with balloons floating around. According to Karen, contrary to belief that this was a cafeteria or a gymnasium, the music video was shot in the basement of a church. Which by the way, must be one big church to have this be a basement. Stop working for just a second. Rolling, rolling. Ready? Rolling. So the concept of the music video is that they're shooting the music video and we're watching the music video being made. Just hearing the opening riff to the song just gives me goosebumps. An amazing way to open the song. Drummer Brian Chase enters from behind and gets set up, and again from the surface, this looks like a plain old rock music video. So what's all the hubbub behind it? This is where Karen O comes in, and once she starts singing, things are about to get emotional. Pack up. I'm straight. A big thing that makes the music video work is how integral the song is for this to all work. So. Let's talk about the song itself. It is a love song. Back in 2003, Karen O was in a relationship with Angus Andrew, the lead singer of the Australian American rock band Liars. And there were issues with their relationship as they would be on tour and could not see each other for long periods of time. And with Angus having to go on tour himself, Karen did not take this well. He was on tour and we never saw each other and I hated it. So I emailed, why do they get to be with you? They don't love you like I love you. That last sentence would become the chorus to this song. They don't love you like I love you. They don't love you like I love you. That has gotta be one of the most simple but impactful lyrics. And these are made more poignant considering there aren't that many lyrics to this song. Well, my kind's your kind, I'll stay. The first verse alone only has five words, but that's what's so interesting about this song. Its minimal selectiveness and what words to choose makes Karen come off as being someone who is herself at a loss for words when wanting their partner to stay. It may not be a surprise to learn that the lyrics were written in five minutes, but in that short time span, it ends up making an amazing song to listen to. I love so many things about this song, especially Nick Zinner's guitar. <laughs> This particular riff right here, one of my all-time favorite riffs. And the way Karen O performs her song in the video has her looking distraught and distracted. She appears to be on the verge of tears as the other members nonchalantly perform their duties for the song. And meanwhile, the crew members are just sitting down watching, some nodding their heads, but overall, don't seem to really actually care. The fact that this video is just the members of Yeah Yeah's performing maps for a video seems like a basic idea at first, but I feel like it's simplicity 
works. You just watch the band perform their song and you just soak it all in. If there's anything that could be considered going over the top, it's their lighting getting more and more overwhelming throughout, which I think can be chalked up to being symbolic of Karen getting overwhelmed with emotion. Just a lot of aspects to this video seems very meticulous in evoking emotion. Even in Karen's interview where she mentions it being shot in a church basement gives this video a lot of weight. As Karen said to the San Francisco Chronicle, it's just one of those things where you have to go to, like a parent's meeting where they get together and eat and have to watch us play. Except instead of parents, it was just our friends. It's about the apathy of being there in the audience. The apathy of being there in the audience. Holy crap. Having your friends being apathetic towards this love song you made for your boyfriend that you want to be with. Even the other two members being focused on the instrument playing, looking to not pay attention to Karen breaking down. Though, that could just be them focusing on their instruments. But there's just this overall feeling that no one cares what Karen has to say. She has her heart on her sleeve and it doesn't elicit a real response. And then the moment happens. Near the end, where the chorus starts up for the last time, Karen starts crying. And you might think that, okay, this is part of the music video. She's meant to cry this part. And honestly, this is a perfect time for her to cry. But in actuality, these tears weren't scripted for the music video. In 2007, in an interview with the enemy, Karen O revealed that these tears were real and they were shed due to being upset that Angus Andrew wasn't at the shoot. They were real tears. My boyfriend at the time was supposed to come to the shoot. He was three hours late and I was just about to leave for a tour. I didn't think he was even going to come and it was the song that was written for him. He eventually showed up and I got myself in a real emotional state. And she was totally fine with Patrick Goddard's keeping the tears in the music video. And in general, the tears is what really make the music video. It comes at such a pivotal moment in the song. Fits in with the theme of such sad emotion throughout. And as they finish their song, all they get is feedback. Nothing. Absolutely haunting. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the yeah, 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 yeah! Once the video premiered on MTV and MTV2, it was an immediate hit, staying on heavy rotation on the channels for weeks. As well, the video would be nominated for Ford Moonman at MTV's Video Music Awards, though winning none of them. And retrospectively, the music video has continued to get praise, including being ranked 24 on Rolling Stone's Greatest Music Videos list. Commercially, the video boosted the album sales immensely. Fever the Tell, which was nearly a year old when the video premiered on MTV, we entered the 200 chart at 158 for the week of February 21st, 2004. And from there, it climbed back up the charts and would hit a new peak at 55 at the beginning of April. Overall, it stayed on the charts for 28 weeks. Before Maps was released as a single, the album only sold 134,000 copies. But after its release, sales blew up to 310,000 copies. It has since been certified gold by the RIAA, and as of 2009, has worldwide sales of over a million copies sold. Maps as a single would also hit the Hot 100, staying on the charts for 13 weeks and peaking at number 87. As well, it peaked at number 9 on the alternative airplay charts. <laughs> You have to wonder though, why did MAPS resonate so well on MTV? Executive Vice President of Music and Talent Programming for MTV and MTV2, Tom Calderon, was quoted in the 2004 issue of Spin Magazine with an interesting answer. In a quote by him, girls have been going, God, this is not a female artist I can relate to. They're saying, I don't relate to Jessica Simpson, or Britney, or Beyonce, but there's something about Karen that I'm intrigued by. Now that's interesting. <laughs> Music in 2004, having all these pop performers, while making good songs, just end up having them not be relatable. Especially with their music videos appearing so unrealistic. Me, love you, save me. Meanwhile, I would definitely suspect there was a girl out there that felt the same emotion Kaylin was feeling when she was performing MAPS. This song absolutely ushered a fan base of women who would find this sound of music to become theirs. And ever since the US release, MAPS has become the area's signature song, still being played by the band during concerts. Kevin herself mentioned still loving to play it after all these years, and this is in spite of the fact that she and Angus would later break up. Some things were never meant to be, just like the area's being in the mainstream spotlight. Because the next music video of theirs would be the band's fourth and final single off of Fever the Tell, 
Why control? Why control? Why control? This is a stark contrast to maps. Kids swearing, violence, gore, all that good stuff. MTV and MTV2 had the sense of this to even get it airing onto the channel. But the areas didn't care. As Nick Zenner said with Entertainment Weekly, we think MTV's deciding to play maps was an extraordinary fluke. We don't see ourselves in that world. Yeah, why control is definitely how the band's sound is, so good luck for everyone expecting another maps. Also worth mentioning that Y Control was directed by veteran music video director Spike Jones, who would date Karen O for a couple of years. As for maps as a song, it is still heavily regarded as one of the best songs for the 2000s. The NME ranked it as number 55 on their list, 150 best tracks in the past 15 years, and called it the best alternative love song. Pitchfork ranked it number 6 on their top 500 best songs of the 2000s. Meanwhile, not only did Rolling Stone call it the 7th best song of that decade, in 2021, when they revised their 500 best songs of all time list, they ranked the song at 101. To put things into perspective, David Bowie's Life on Mars is at 105, and Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil is at 106. That's not even pointing out the other 397 songs that it beat out. Almost breaking to the top 100 and beating out so many famous songs. Such an impact this track has had. Which is very much obvious when it comes to the many occasions where Maps has been ripped off. Here's the thing, we started our friends. 2004 not only saw Maps being released as a single in the US, Kelly Clarkson's mega hit Since You've Been Gone would also be released. The song was written and produced by Max Borden and Dr. Luke, with Dr. Luke explaining the inspiration for making Since You Be Gone in an interview with Billboard. There was a conscious move by Max and myself because we were listening to alternative and indie music and talking about some song. I don't remember what it was. I said, ah, I love this song. And Max was like, if they could just write a damn pop chorus on it. It was driving him nuts because that indie song was sort of like on six, going on seven, Going on 8, the chorus comes, and it goes back down to 5. It drove him crazy. And when he said that, I was like, light bulb, why don't we do that, but put a big chorus on it? Brilliant! Brilliant! He never outright said the song was Maps, but Karen O absolutely recognized the guitar break from anywhere when she heard Clarkson's song. <laughs> Karen would later compare it to being bitten by a poisonous varmint, which poisonous varmint is a really appropriate descriptor for Dr. Luke. This wouldn't be the last time Maps would be used for another song, as Beyonce's 2016 song Hold Up would include a pretty familiar line in her song. Though in this case it was based on a tweet by Vampire Weekend's Ezra Koenig and was inspired by Maps wholeheartedly. On a happier note in this case, all three members of Yeah Yeahs would be credited as songwriters for Beyonce's single. There's also another example I would like to bring up because I've never seen this be used as an example of being inspired by Maps, but I'll save that for another music video time. Truth be told, when I listened to Maps the first time, after I did, I really did not like it. I can go even so far as say I hated it. For reasons I'm not fully sure now, but I believe the reasoning for my dislike of it was I just didn't understand it. And after subsequent replays in the following years, I adore this song now. I get the sense of sadness in listening to Karen wanting her lover to stay with her. And I love Zenner's guitar throughout, complemented well with Brian Chase's drums. It's so well produced. It's a beautiful love song that perfectly conveys how much the relationship meant between Karen with Angus, even if the relationship failed. It resonates so well with boys and girls at the time and captured an audience for the areas for years to come. And this quote by Karen really does seem indicative of wanting that teen target audience. The only reason I wanted to be on a major label was for people to hear Maps. I expect kids to listen to it in a parking lot in the summer. It's for everyone, but I imagine it scoring teen romance. The soundtrack to star cross relationships. I've listened to the band live and seen them before Maps during their set and you can feel the emotions in the air during it. And I can just say, the success the success the band has garnered over the years is a massive triumph in rock music, and I 100% would attribute this to the music video. It introduced many to their signature song and garnering Yeah Yeah's a wider audience. With it being one of the best videos to one of the best songs of the decade, this put the Yeah Yeah's on the map. Thanks for your time.